All right, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the CMAS Podcast. I'm your host today, Dr. Michael Roblard, on my channel, and uh, Tim Gordon will be emceeing it uh, today. But yeah, we got our usual cast of characters, Tim Gordon, Elliot Hulse, Will Nolan, and myself. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the interesting topic of Catholicism, the FBI, and censorship. So uh, I'll hand things off to you, Tim. Uh, you can emcee today. On the microphone. What's there up, you go. fellas? What's up, Elliot and Will and Mike? How are you boys doing? Not bad, not bad, man. The crowd. Yeah, good, thanks. Microphone check. One, two, one, two. Uh, well, this topic is relevant specifically because cancellation is something that everybody with a microphone and uh, an unwelcome opinion constantly cowers from or at least has the back of their mind if they don't cower from it. And it's it's been relevant in my life a couple different times. The most recent one mm. was last week when I was threatened by Patreon for maybe a little bit of style saying, uh, saying Catholic social teaching on se sexual ethics. So it's the kind of stuff that we're always sort of, it always hovers in the background when we're talking. Right. We're all gonna be put to moral dilemmas. Because, you know, Patreon is not the only way I support my family, but it's certainly the most regular, uh, the, the closest thing, approximation to a paycheck that's regular and with a, a payday. Uh, I was I was canceled on January the 31st or at least threatened. And I've heard they do this, they being Patreon, because people know that their money is ready for them on February 1st or 2nd. And I told them you know, go, go pound sand. Basically they, they wanted me to take down three specific videos about LMNOP Q plus issues. And I told them I'm not going to take these down. So I guess steal my money or whatever. I guess technically it's not stealing because they don't take it. They just divert it back to my patrons. It's, it's an enraging thought, of course. And uh, they ended up giving me the money. And then after they gave me the money, they said, but the, the 24 hour ultimatum is still on. I said, well, my position's still the same. I'm not gonna budge. This is uh, an unbudgeable issue. So they seemed honestly surprised by someone who was like, yeah, you might have you know, four figures of dollars of mine, but I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, doesn't change my response. I don't know how many times that's happened, but it needs to be happening more because Catholics who are serious and conservatives in general are being increasingly harrowed and, and pushed up against the wall. And it creates externalities and challenges and inefficiencies in your day. But what I've been doing is just diverting those patrons who are kind enough to support what I do online to locals and to other Patreon alternatives like uh, Subscribestar. And it's been a hassle, but that's what we do. And then of course, in that week, Kyle Serafin, who's an FBI whistleblower, comes out and says that there, there is a targeting program for the FBI, the way that they, the way that they can hone in on their enemies, their political opponents, those without the current political capital. And they profile basically the TLM community. So that means that all of this makes sense. I'm not being paranoid. It wasn't a coincidence that Patreon found me. There is a, a system where in the crosshairs, really all four of us and, and anybody that's a faithful Catholic, particularly a, a TLM going Catholic. And so it's an Im important and relevant conversation today, even though I'm, I'm not in Hattiesburg in my house, I'm in Mobile. But um, I thought I thought this is a relevant topic for us to talk about today. What are the stakes of the game? Free speech, which not all conservatives really like free speech. So I think we should talk about what it is first. Secondly, why are these the stakes in the game? Why does the left and the totalitarian state, the, particularly the LMNOPQ plus totalitarian state, need folks to back down on free speech? Um, j just last night cam thomas who's a, a young guard for the orlando magic he said the phrase no homo and the nba is making him go through the ritual hand washing and uh, uh 
process humiliation just for saying no homo in a joke after a uh, game. So the stakes of the game are large and the left gets it. The right still doesn't. We still have a right wing that that says they don't even like free speech. And, and so as part of, you know, I guess the conclusion to that sort of syllogism, what, what is it? Why does it matter? Why do they get it? Uh, we should discuss some today how it can conform, how it does conform to the principles of Christendom, uh, free speech and quote unquote, not being censored. So should begin at the beginning. Any of you guys who have a, a thought on why the stakes of the game actually matter, I, I'd be very interested in, in teasing this out with you conversationally. Well, I just want to start by saying well done for not yeah. cowing because so many people do. I mean, it's not a surprise that you didn't cow because you lost your job over a similar point in the principle as well. And there's a, a great quote from St. Augustine. He says that we detect weakness in a mind which cannot bear physical oppression or the stupid opinion of the mob. And taking <laughs> your money is one of the main ways in which they try to oppress you physically by making life harder. And you've got a strong mind to be able to resist it. And it's a good model for people to follow. Thanks, Will. Yeah, I was going to say exactly what Will said. Blessed are you when they persecute you, right? So we know that you're doing the right thing if they're coming after you. And what really kind of is interesting to me, bugs me a little bit, is that these are supposedly the intellectual class, but to shut down conversation is the most anti-intellectual thing that a human being can do. If your mm -hmm. ideas are so good, then they should stand the test of criticism. And obviously it's not about intellectualism or raising uh, ideas. It's power, it's control and tyranny at its finest. So how do you think, uh, thank you both, it's kind, but how ought Christians to mediate, to navigate the, the tough, I don't know if it's a via media, because I, I, I don't really, I don't like the name via media middle ways now with when we live in extreme times, which of course call for uh, extreme measures, non-half measures, but how ought Christians to navigate the idea of fighting back in the ways that we can, where we have the wherewithal, and the, the kind of white martyrdom that runs with things like losing your job or at least losing your income. No one really cares about losing their job, right? They care about losing the income. If I could lose the job and keep the income, then cool. But, you know, like, I think people hear well, this is just what a Christian is called to do. Mm -hmm. And it typifies what is anathema to a lot of young people who might otherwise become Christians. They're like, well, if all I have to do is absorb body blows, absorb body blows, take one to the chin, take one to the forehead. Like, I don't really want to become a Christian. That's part, but not the whole story. That's part of, but not the whole story, right? And th that's what we have to articulate. Well, as Christians, we actually can fight back. And it's actually very fun to fight back and, and to offer uh, a defiant cheek to our foes. So I, I think when stuff like this comes up, I was, I was tweeting this morning at this young guy. He's probably 21. I think he's a second year guy uh, on the magic. And he, he he said, no home. I mean, they were talking about like, there's a big trade involving Kevin Durant, both Ky Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant got traded away from the Nets. I know you guys, none of you guys are big basketball guys, but they lost like two superstars. And he was just making a joke. He was like, well, you know, we brought some new guys, some fresh meat into Brooklyn on the Nets because we didn't have very good looking guys before and no homo. I mean, that's literally all he said yeah, after a game. He's just having a good time. He's a bright young star. Uh, just been balling out the last like 10 games and everyone. I, I just learned his name about six games ago. So he's just having a good time thriving. And all of a sudden uh, he's, he's forced by the non-Christians, let's say the non-Christians who run the NBA to apologize, just like Kyrie Irving. So they're not Christians. So what they do is they characterize everything that a Christian would do. And this is what happened to me on Patreon too. Also, let's say non-Christians who run that company. They, they just qualify every single act of faith that a Christian might take in the public forum as racist or um, phobic. And literally Christians aren't allowed to interact in the public space. We're not even talking about church and state interactions. Now we're talking about 
public cultural fora and faith interactions. So there has to be some pushback. But the, here's the ironic part that I'd say a lot of the young men who would be otherwise Christians don't get. The pushback begins with accepting the body blows and all that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think that that's that's right. I think that that does make sense as well. And yeah, I'd, I'd like to also echo Will and Elliot's comments as well. Yeah, well, well done on you, man. And it's exactly what I expect from Tim Gordon. So it's uh, yeah, it's a great example again. Not not backing down to this nonsense. Um, Thanks, Steve. Yeah, and I think it's it's um we we touched on this point before. I remember where um, I forget what episode, but Ellie brought up the point of like, well, you know, is, is it our, is it just that, you know, we're in a fallen world and, and the, the lot of Christians is to take those body blows. And your response was something like, yeah, but once, once Christendom is established, we have an obligation to like, to like, to hold on to it. Um, can we revisit that? That's, you know, do you know the point I'm talking about? Like, of course. Can you, what what that point is because i think that's relevant to, to to what you're talking about right right now you know what i mean is it just a matter of like we stoically accept the martyrdom or is there a point where it it's uh we're morally obligated to push back or at least dig our heels in well elliot helped me to reframe the problematic the way the way the, i think the most fundamental setup for the problematic is this Right now, I'm getting twit because I'm on my phone. I'm getting uh, people people responding to me saying, "Bro, don't apologize to this young young NBA player on the Magic." But it's it's basically like this: we live in uh, an anti Christian dystopia, and when when the Christian order's not established, we're strangers in a strange land, you know, as they say. And of course, the lawfare. The culture and the lawfare, which are mutually informative, tell us that basically any public expression of Christianity is is unwelcome or is racist. Uh, so we say, oh, we need free speech, which is, of course, true within certain confines. We do need free speech. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Elliot, correct me if, if, if you think I'm mischaracterizing anything, but I, I do want to hear what you have to say about this. And then, you know, you get kind of hand-wringing exemptions taken to, like, libertarian iterations of what free speech is. And so people go too far the other way. And they say, well, if we ever get, get back a regime, which is not something we're going to take back geographically, it just means in some smaller polity in the future, we'll regroup and form some sort of uh, Christian republic or what have you then we shouldn't be so forgiving with our free speech just as they weren't with us. And of course, this is correct. Un under this uh, set of parameters, I, this is where I agree with it. It's like, yeah, free. we never, I mean, American free speech was actually uh, informed in the 1770s and 1780s by something called the Zanger Laws. All the Zanger Laws meant by propositions of jurisprudence was no prior restraints on language. So literally, if they knew you're going to give a speech that they didn't like, uh, the colonial government, they would just set the police up to listen to you give the speech. It was totally legal for them to illegalize it or to, to punish you legislatively afterwards. All free speech meant, according to the First Amendment, which eventually codified all this, was they weren't allowed to prior restrain you like show up where you're going to give the speech and stop you from giving it. They had to wait for it. That's all free speech meant under the First Amendment. Most of the other amendments got ra radically uh, uh, cut back, made de minimis. The First Amendment was the only one that actually expanded the right under question. So while we're saying we need are, you know, no prior restraints and we need sensible laws against speech instead of outlawing basically christian speech or saying no homo which is just an expression of straight pride right this is what i was telling uh, uh young uh cam thomas <laughs> that's just an expression of straight pride that's not even a christian thing i don't, I don't know how no homo is um offensive in any corner of the world 
even the, the non-Christian run NBA. But also we, we need to, you know, anathematize um, maybe expressions of Satanism or, or really anything outside of Christianity at the appropriate level of government. I always just say this shouldn't be happening at local government, which is what the church teaches. But that, that's how we strike back, I think. Uh, I don't know if that's too libertarian or not libertarian enough for some of you, but uh, uh, Elliot, what do you think of that? Hmm. Well, are you suggesting that uh, this is something that we need to address at the local level? Is that what I hear you saying? That getting involved in local, small local government and uh, and working it out that way from a grassroots level is the approach we should be taking? I'm trying to follow. Well, I'm saying that's all, that's already what the lawfare in America addresses. Like, it's not super local, but at the state level, like, remember, not to be a broken record, the Bill of Rights only constrained the state governments. Uh, sorry, the, the federal government. It never constrained the state government. So right. if I'm speaking imprecisely, the, the state governments are, quote unquote, allowed to violate the first eight amendments. You know, they could. That's that's why we just had to codify under something called incorporation doctrine, like the Second Amendment. This has changed in the 20th century. One by one, we started incorporating the Bill of Rights, free speech, whatever, First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, against the states as well as the federal government. But that's pretty much the codified guarantee that this is intended to be happening at, at the local level. I mean, just, just at the level of the lawfare. We need to address it culturally to, in order to make sure that what we're permitting and... and uh, and proscribing is the correct kinds of speech to be permitted and proscribed. That's just about taking back the culture with Christianity. But yeah, the codification has to happen at the at the state level, not the federal level. That's all I was saying. Hmm. You know, I tend to think more on the even even smaller roots uh, in terms of what do small groups do in order to keep certain flames that are being extinguished alive. You know, when you read. Um, uh, Rod Dreher in uh, Live Not By Lies, he recounts the Bolshevism of Eastern Europe, and he proposes that we ought to be prepared for that to be unfolding in America, and of course in the West, nonetheless. And he gives a lot of really good uh, advice. I, I think it's tough for us to, number one, be willing to accept the persecution, right? And this is what he proposes. Uh, that it's going to come. It's a it's a byproduct of uniting ourselves with Christ in His persecution and His passion. Um, but then at the same time, to quietly convene and continue to fan those flames of uh, Christian moral value. And so that being said, you know we do live in an integrated world through the internet and the net. And so you know. Uh, the borders are much broader and wider, but they're all uh, in, in, the interstate highway is now the, uh, the, the internet highway. Yeah. And so who owns these roads? So for example, like Patreon, <laughs> knowing, knowing that you have conversations that are antithesis to the, to uh, Patreon or, you know, most of these uh, tech giant uh, tyrants, uh, really, I think it's a matter of creating and convening in our own small internet factions. Like who we, it would be good to own, say, for example, the website that we would be promoting our, these ideas on, right? Owning the servers <laughs> that, that these, uh, websites are hosted on owning the, uh, the, uh, how you'd say merchant accounts that these conversations are being funded by, right? Like, so government, yeah, is one thing, uh, but then we're really not even run by the government any longer. We're run by uh, corporations, big tech. Big tech owns our governments. You know, these corporations own our governments. Facebook does what it wants. It's its own country in a lot of ways. So I think the a solution, I think a, a, probably digital balkanization is ultimately what's going to happen and so you kind of see a little bit with websites like gab and so forth but i think it's uh gaining digital real estate 
where our voices can't be silenced. Yeah, a fortiori, just to add what you just said, Patreon also told me, they said, it's not good enough that you take down your YouTube link to your Patreon patrons. That won't suffice. We want you to take down the YouTube video even after you de-link it to us, Patreon. So they have cross mojinated with their sister corporations, which help them to run the world from a, let's say, non-Christian perspective. And yeah, so that, so that 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 just proof adds fuel to the fire of what you're saying. Will and Mike, do you guys agree? I'm sure you do. Yeah, it's funny that you can draw such a hostile response when you're telling the truth, but you can make all kinds of mistakes and you never get shut down. It's the truth in particular that really stings like this and that gets you cancelled. And it's interesting to think about why free, free speech is important. And it's because it has instrumental value, because it helps us to express truth. Whereas something like free speech absolutism, that any speech whatsoever that somebody wants to print or put out there um, has value, that's not the Catholic position. So when we think about free speech, it's valuable because truth is valuable. And if you look at something like Pius IX's encyclical with the syllabus of errors, he says that citizens don't have the right to a complete liberty, which neither ecclesiastical nor civil authority can restrain, a liberty to manifest and declare their ideas, whatever they may be, openly and publicly, in speech or by the printed page or in any way whatsoever. And that's echoing something that Pope Gregory the 16th said as well. So free speech absolutism isn't a Catholic value. Popes have long recognized that it has to be curtailed for the sake of public order, the common good, and also for the church as well. We wouldn't want errors being propagated in the education system, for example, regarding faith and morals. So I think it's interesting to think about the concept of free speech from a specifically Catholic point of view. Why do we care that it's under threat now? Because we can't say true things. Why would we want it to be controlled if we were the ones in power? Because nobody has the right to spread error. Error has no rights. Hmm. Yeah. Mike, are you on this still? He, he expressed to me he had, he was having a I, I I have I have some thoughts on those. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. I can can you hear me? I I, uh, yeah. I caught the very tail end of that, so I'll, I'll keep listening. I'll pick up the thread in a sec. Um, he said very tail end of that. I thought you said the fairy tale ending of that. I was like, ooh, we're getting getting <laughs> less prosaic. Oh, did, so are we still we're still we're still pushing this out live, right? That your your internet issue hasn't affected. Yeah, it looks yeah, it looks like it's still it gives me the option to turn off live stream. So I guess okay, yeah, yeah let's still on. Let's yeah. I'm on my phone yeah. now though. Yeah, I mean, it's not. I I mean, censorship is a bigger problem culturally than even in our lawfare because of, for 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 us Americans this side of the pond, the so-called free speech absolutism is I think. I, as far as I can tell, it's like a false dilemma. Like, I don't really know anyone that's pushing for free speech absolutism. And um, I think it should, like, it's, it's yeah, it's clear. Like, it's not right to just say anything because you have a larynx and uh, a mind that has generated propositions that might be wicked that you want to express with your larynx, right? The, the air into which the words are spoken tremble. Um. So I, I'm not sure. Do we have? A, is there even a side that I, I, I'm literally asking this? I'm not being facetious. Is there a, an appreciable, cognizable side we can point at that really is, in the true sense of the term, free speech absolutist? Well, because I hear the term a lot. I don't know anybody. You know, I have a lot of friends who are libertarians or quasi libertarians. I, even they, I don't. I don't think are free speech absolutists. 
I can't think of a particular group, but you hear it get raised as a point of principle in debate, like what you would want to shut some debates down, or you think there are some opinions that shouldn't be discussed. And I think one underrated response to that is that even to have some debates is to lose them because mm. you are mm -hmm. dignifying mm. the ideas with a response when really they haven't met the threshold for being taken seriously. Right. And if you right. look at some of the roots of the whole idea of free speech and J.S. Mill and enlightenment thinking, mm -hmm. it is expressly hostile towards the kind of tradition that Catholicism values. So it was seen at the outset as a kind of attack on tradition. So when we're playing with free speech as Catholics, we have to be aware of that and take a more nuanced view of it than the people who just think that free speech is some kind of core value of a society. Yes, it is, because truth is, but it's not a value in itself. Yeah, agree, agree. I mean, yeah, I'm not... I'm not pushing back hard by saying that. I'm just saying in society, like like Aristotle says, look, virtue is a golden mean. The, the, the right amount of speech, therefore, is a golden mean because all, all golden means are arites or excellences. What we're looking for is how much should a person be able to speak the truth? And obviously Catholics are the only ones with the full truth, right? So how much are, I guess we're asking in our ideal society, how much are non-Catholics allowed to speak? And this is, a difficult per set of parameters to define. Um, I guess I guess it makes sense to say, well, he here's what here's what we don't mean. This is what Aristotle does. Virtue is uh, a middle way between two extremes, both of which are vices: the vice of excess and the vice of deficiency. But he's he's very careful to say it is a, it is a geometric mean. It is not a, a algebraic mean. And this means that it will always be closer to one side than the other. So, yes, free speech via media, the proper amount of free speech is a mean, but it's a geometric mean. And it's a lot closer, I'm saying, to free speech absolutism, the one extreme, the vice of excess or whatever, than it is to uh, prior restraint or something whatever the opposite extreme is that anti-free speech absolutism it's closer to that because by its very nature once you live in a civil society i i think i think america is a really good model again because of the robust tradition of states rights here until the 60s basically sodomy was illegal porn was illegal contraception was illegal um, there's no such thing as gay marriage. And literally until the 1960s, it was illegal in all the conservative American states. Um, and in those same quote, red states, it would have been um, strong. I haven't checked this, but it would be strongly, strongly encouraged by the lawfare and the culture to say, hey, we, you know, we're not, we're not going to let you talk about what's now called, you know, LGBTQ stuff at the library. We're not going to let you talk around kids. We're not going to, you're not allowed to do that. And politics are always downstream of culture. So it's, it's because one, they got inside the political system, they changed the lawfare. And so now we talk about this as if politics dictates all this. I think it's really the culture. I, I agree with you. I'm not a free speech absolutist. I don't know anyone who is, but I'm saying that the parameter should be defined like this. If you're in a conservative state or province in Canada, it makes sense that the kind of speech being curtailed is the kind of speech that we make fun of when we're off the air, right? Uh, LMNOPQ plus type stuff. That's the kind of speech that, that will be curtailed in a red state, in a blue state. It makes sense to me that they're going to try to do this. I think the real problem, and this is a topic for another day, is the federalization of um, you know local enforcement, so so that people in a local area aren't allowed to rule for themselves. I mean, cuius regio, eius religio, as we've talked about before, 
that that makes the most sense. That is the principle of subsidiarity. And I think it kind of it kind of rules all of these different conversations we have when we start talking about the law firm. But I think the cultures as are more interesting anyway. It's like what I could I just say this thing, it's a little off topic. Even some of the Catholics that defended me, they're like, thank you very much for the Catholics that defended me, but some of them did so and made me feel like I was, you know. I don't know, uh, Kanye West or, or E. Michael Jones or something, because the way they defended me was with such kid gloves that it's like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I required like I'm not naming names here, but some of these were like, hey, you know, support Tim. He's got a family on Patreon. I, I don't agree with everything he said. And then that's A. And then B, disclaimers, like, I want to reiterate, I don't agree with everything he said. And then C, like, I, I, I can't say I agree with lots of stuff he said. It's like, how many, this, how is the culture of anti-free speech taking such a hold that a fellow Catholic, a fellow faithful Catholic, and this happened with a couple different people, even when they're defending me, which I appreciate very much, they're like, bounding this function with five, six, seven disclaimers as if I'm radioactive for simply saying, you know, uh, it's not okay to be that way. Do you know what I mean? I, I, it's, it's shocking sometimes and almost like a backhanded compliment when people defend you. I don't know if any of you guys have experienced this. People defend you and they're like, okay, no, I don't agree about everything, but you know, Tim should be able to have a living. I'm like, Thank you. But that is really, man, I feel more like a leper than I ever did before. I feel more like a leper because of my friends on this side and the way they're defending me than I feel like a leper because of my enemies. You know what I mean? Yeah. When, when the heat gets turned up a bit and it's on certain topics and people fear there'll be a chance that they'll get burnt as well by being close to you, then you find out that they're not so free speech after all. Uh, even having been sacked over a point of principle regarding free speech, I found that when I dared to interview E. Michael Jones, even though I don't agree with him on a lot, the fact that I'd just spoken to him was enough for some people that I'd crossed the line. And they're like, whoa, we're not that kind of free speech, Will. You can't talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> It, I remember that fear, you know, and so I think somewhere in our primal brain, we have this instinct to want to be a part of the crowd, you know, not to be ostracized, not to be rejected. And the minute we watch someone get kicked out of the tribe, so to say, uh, the fear uh, hood comes up and all of a sudden they're they think that by being an association that they're somehow threatened. And, you know, I, you use the term white martyrdom before, like what sissies are we such that we're willing to bite our tongue or to turn our back on one another for fear of people not liking you? I mean, that's how silly and sissyish and sad and weak we became as a culture. I, in fact, I'm not blowing my own horn, but if they're, if they don't hate you, in fact, one of my mentors said this, if, if you don't piss somebody off by noon every day, you're not actually saying anything. And mm, so right. it's, it's this, it, again, once uh, as the whole conversation that we tend to have is it's anti-masculinity at its finest. Cause to be a man is to be defiant. It's to stand up for what's right, regardless of what's popular. And we're just way too soft to take that stance. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And th the other thing too, it's like by that type of distancing from from somebody, um, as Will has pointed out in the past, it, it doesn't even work, right? It's like even at the end of the day, right. like that that type of okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to come to this guy's defense this time, and you know, maybe maybe the the mob won't come after me. Like it, it, it rationally, it doesn't even work. At the end of the day, like it really showed that that it, the, the 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 monster is still coming for you. It's just coming for you later, right? And in fact, they will disdain you for your weakness. That, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Or in the case of it, what you're saying is totally true, Mike. Or in the case of the people that gave a defense of 
canceled guy X, in this case, it was me. They gave a defense of you, but was like, look, I don't want you to associate me with him too much. I'm just saying he and his family should be able to eat or live. If, if people can either be like, oh, I see through the, you know, I'm reading the, reading the, the middle lines here. I'm, I'm reading the subtext. You're not, it's not a full throated defense or the other people can take the opposite approach and be like, Oh, well, you're still with him. You want him to be able to eat. Don't you know we're the left? We play for keeps. I don't, I want this guy done. I want him gone. Um, so you're associated with him anyway. It never accomplishes the kind of parsing that the folks who issue this kind. And I mean, I'm not persecuting him because there are a few of these people that did come to my defense and they're trying to do it. And it was, well done insofar as was like, hey, obviously this is the kind of person that lives with a little more fear of such a situation than me. And they they overcame it to say, hey, you know, at least support Tim on his other Catholic channels. Like, thank you for doing that. I'm just, I would call all Catholics, I would call all men, even if you're not Catholic, to think twice before you start backing up an inch. I, I, I'm reminded of something that... Um, Bodhi Bodhisattva in uh, in Point Break says to uh, Keanu Reeves, and he's like, "What I like about you is you're a bulldog. You didn't back down to them an inch when he was getting jumped at the showers and and beaten up by four guys. That is what a man is called to do, and that is a very fundamental belief that I cling to. Uh, you know, I cling to all this." Catholic dogmas, but that's like a secular dogma I just cling to. Never back down an inch. It's one thing if you're going to apologize in the confessional between you and the priest, but if it's not a sin, if it's a quote-unquote social sin that even Pope Francis makes reference to, never apologize for social sins unless it is an actual ontological sin. Just say, sorry, not sorry. You know, I, I got a policy. Unless I've actually violated God's law, I'm not apologizing. And this goes for folks that would out two sides of the mouth defend me, but at the same time sort of impugn what I stand for by being like, it might not be the LGBTQ issue. I think, I think a lot of the people that were, that I'm talking about were defending me on that, but might have an issue with, I don't know, feminism out uh, as, as intoned by me. And all I would say is that I'm just echoing what you said, Mike, you're never doing the careful parsing that you think you're accomplishing when you do that. You're either going to be, <laughs> People won't listen to you and they'll be like, well, I mean, if he's such a jerk, why am I going to give to him on locals or on subscribe star? Right. If that's kind of that's kind of what I heard with some of these messages or the leftists are always going to go because they're the totalitarians. They're going to go, well, look, you're still trying to get him money. So why say you don't like all the things he said? Everyone knows that anyway. No two human beings agree about 100 percent of stuff, but you're still trying to get him money and resources. So you're with him anyway. You're going to be thrown into the gulags with me, even with the 10 or, or 11 weak sounding Mamby Pamby uh, softeners, you know? This is why when people talk about cancel culture being the cause of our problems, although there's something to that, they're overlooking the fact that it's also a symptom of them because it only works when people are already weak. It's just like in nature when the predators will go for the weak ones. So the guys who are giving those pussyfooting defenses, it's just more blood in the water when someone can see that they partially mm. lost their nerve. And that's totally. why I want to repeat this St. Augustine line. So I think it's just so important. We detect weakness in a mind which cannot bear physical oppression or the stupid opinion of the mob. Now, if you're already afraid of the stupid opinion of the mob and you've forgotten the commandment to fear God only, then you're in trouble because they've already got you rocked and they can exploit the fact you're going to make stupid decisions based on those misguided priorities. Mm. So men in particular have got the kind of culture that they deserved based on their spiritual state. Cancel culture is a reflection of that and a lack of spine. Yeah. 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 So that's like, that's like the most insight in, in 30 seconds. Um, I've heard in a long time. Well, that's really good. I mean, it's a symptom and we all, we've already, we've already reaped what we sown or sown what we've reaped. Uh, however that works, not a former, but it, it, it's, it's just, you know, our chickens are coming home to roost. And 
some of us, those minority of the men, like, you know, the four of us and some of our friends that legitimately didn't sow this stuff, uh, we, you know, we're like, this is really ugly. This is really untoward. I mean, can we talk just uh, for, for half a moment about, I know it's in the history now, but what happened to you when you got sacked from eating well, like, it's horrible. You're shocked. You have literally the carpet feels like it's taken from underneath you because now you have to do this flurry of activity just to make sure that your family can eat over the next month or that you have some place to live. But then after that, once you start getting those, you kind of tamping down a hurricane, you know, it's not a tempest in a teapot. It's a legitimate tempest, but you're, you're, you're tending to the big inconveniences and externalities that follow upon it at first. But then once you start noticing the smaller things you have to smooth out, you know, you're getting more fine, fine grain. And that's when you start noticing, okay, who just came out and said the right things, the, the cool things like quoting Augustine. I mean, that's like the perfect quote. And then who, who did kind of, you know, median approaches to defending me and then who didn't defend me on the other extreme. But then this type that I'm talking about where it's like mealy mouth and people that want to be strong, but aren't necessarily strong and, and are like embarrassed of you, but they don't want to be Peter. Not that we're, we're Christ, but anyone that's sacrificed is a, a Christ figure temporarily. That's what white martyrdom is. So they're, they're like, you admire this about the people that even that are giving the mealy mouth response, right? You're like, okay, they, you know, they've said, I'm not going to be Peter denying Christ three times. So they give their best and their best. A lot of times is just, Hey, I'm still not with him, but I'm not going to completely disown him. And, and then you're, you're trying to make sense of this. And you're like, well, I have these categories of people in my life and they're only proven tested by fire. My fire is that, did you go through this process with Eaton? Yeah, for sure. And I think anyone who is facing this kind of situation, whether it's about point of principle at work or whatever it might be, don't get angry at the people who do what they're capable of, but not as much as you want them to. You just have yeah. to be grateful for what they're able to do. And you may as well get angry at someone for being six foot on the basketball court rather than six, eight. Some people haven't got it in them because perhaps they haven't practiced that skill. Virtue is a skill on some level and the situation caught them off guard and they didn't have the right kind of things cultivated or for something, some other reason, it just pushed them past the limit in some other way. You don't know exactly what's going on. So to avoid becoming bitter about it, I think it's a really bad thing to happen to people. Just be grateful, but don't expect everyone to come out swinging for you because that's not going to happen a few will but in general no smart yeah for the record i hope yeah i'm not trying to give that impression I, I don't think you think i am but i'm not trying to give that impression gratefulness is the key to these situations in general but you're you're 100 percent right will like i, I don't want to sound bitter i i appreciate even with this recent this recent uh dust up with patreon i i appreciate everyone who said even word one about it so thank you to those who did i just i'm just responding because it's it's really stark when you see like whoa i, I i'm like a leper you know even those who would defend me are doing so out of the goodness of their own hearts like sometimes it's more a self-realization like wow like you gave a lecture on the patriarchy i i i'm not anywhere i'm not situated anywhere outside of the western tradition but but my some of my colleagues are regarding me like a leper now, like a, I have social leprosy. And I'm like, I never thought of myself like a EMJ or I've, I've never felt like I've ventured out onto any of these limbs. And I guess the fact of the matter is in an insane clown world, Mike, you and I talk about this a lot, just talking about the things we talk about on Fridays, which feels very PG rated, right? G, PG rated. Even these C mask shows will get you the kind of mealy mouth defenses from, from more politically correct, but still good, faithful, goodly Catholics. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the noose is tightening, man, you know? So it's like, say, like, 
we could be having normal con- a normal conversation from th- 2010 would look like you know like we're, we're, we're edgy far right extremists at this point you know it's just like the, the the space in which sanity and truth can operate can existentially exist is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and each person is now forced with a situation are they going to keep shrinking their souls into that space or, or are they going to 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 push back and and that's the we are running out of room we're running out of room in so many ways where it literally any statement of truth the most obvious of truths will at some point become criminalized that is the direction of travel yeah it's wild because i was thinking about again this young uh player i think he's the second year guy on the orlando magic that i keep referencing his name is cam thomas he's recently gained some national notoriety because he's really been playing playing well um but is he on the net? He's not on the Mavs. Why do I keep saying he's on the Magic? He's on the Nets. Why, why do I keep saying that? He's on the Brooklyn Nets. And he literally just made this little totally harmless joke. It's a straight pride joke, right? He, they were talking about the guys that got traded away, the guys that they got. Oh, you know, um, we had good enough looking guys on this team. No homo. That's all he said. He just said, look, no, that's a, that is a full-throated uh, expression of straight pride, right? Which is not should not be threatening even to centrist-minded pro-LGBTQ people, right? You're just saying this is not what I am. <laughs> I am not. I'm not one of the guys from that side, which is not necessarily condemning it. Even now, not that I have any problem with condemning it, but I don't think he was trying to condemn it. He was just saying straight pride, and even an expression of Christian pride, straight pride male pride which is what we do here on fridays an expression of basically all those things but especially male pride even if we're not impugning the other side they will receive it as a slight to the other side of things won't they well you call you know you're saying straight pride but really more than anything it was a joke right like (laughs) nobody says nobody says that with their fist in the air uh you know going on parades for their straightness uh it, it, it was just sort of a colloquial sort of language that we use as sort of a funny thing that obviously people with no sense of humor uh can't handle sorry i don't know why that was so yeah i'm talking about it like it was some like straight pride brothers like the 21 convention guys are more like that unironically but he was literally i mean literally spencer dinwiddie was standing next to him as he gave the after game interview and spencer dinwiddie started cracking up so right. you're right he's joking but it's yeah. a joke and with it's, that yeah it go shows ahead. how depraved we are as, as a society when the comedians can't you know fulfill their craft i mean even in the times i you know of course i don't know for sure you guys are better historians than me but i from what i understand you know there would be the court jester that would be there with the king and he would poke fun he would roast and it was a matter of maintaining humility right like the joker can get away with saying things because it's a joke and you know although it may have a thread of um truth to it it's to be taken lightheartedly. You could just see how heavy the hearts are on these people who are defending their bad ideas. You know that line from uh, uh, Lord Shaftesbury, 17th century writer, he wrote a little bit about comedy. And he said that um, nothing is ridiculous except what is deformed, whereas truth may bear all lights. So this idea that falsehood is particularly susceptible to ridicule, I think that's re- what's really going on here. So you, one of the the quickest ways to get in trouble is to have some kind of true and also punchy joke about this, which is why the left really don't like memes and you get the shutdown <laughs> on that. So it doesn't surprise me that Elliot is, is completely right that it's a joke. And that's why it's got the attention that it's got, because they really don't like that. Yeah, yeah. It, Tim, I, when I cut out, um, did you guys talk about the issue of Patreon being a private company and that they could very well say, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's our free speech. We, you know, we, we set our own standards. Did, you know, like, did we address that point, too, where people go, look, you're 
the free market's open, you know, go be the next, be Catholic Andrew Torba, go, go, go create, you know, nobody's stopping you. Just go make, make your own internet, you know, just go do it. No one, no one's censoring you on that side. You're just going to get to work for it. Well, I do my, my lawyer, you know, who I've, I've kept very busy over the last two and a half years. My, uh, my lawyer, uh, is, Lamandry and Jonah, and they they're responsible for keeping a lot of people's freedoms during COVID. They they did the Mount Soledad Cross case against I think the ACLU in San Diego. They've argued in front of the Supreme Court. They're all Catholic dudes um, on behalf of the Catholics. So so many times that I just I just kind of reflexively send him uh, what happens to me as it happens you know, once every six months or so. And he hooked me up with an East Coast attorney who's a, a trad Catholic, Chris Ferrara, who I've admired for a long time. And I, I spoke to Chris Ferrara the other day and I was like, look, can we try these out? Can we try out the legal theory that's called state action doctrine, which is basically if you're a common carrier, even if you're a private company, you're the equivalent of a common carrier. You're basically acting on behalf of the state. And um, it's a way of impositioning the 14th Amendment to curtail the rights of small business owners, even though they're not they're not the state. The state is the only one that's delimited by the 14th Amendment. Now, I don't like this. I don't like the notion of the 14th Amendment or state action doctrine treating private actors like the state. But they've done it to us for so long. So I'm like, let's let's try this out. Let's make this. Um, a major case. They're a common carrier. And he's like, yeah, well, this is kind of going up through the courts right now. So we, we might, you know, might end up making, making this work as a, in other words, your question is a private company. Well, it's their free speech. They can support who they want to. One, it's a contractual issue. There could be a contractual issue, but two, if they're really acting like a state actor, then it wouldn't merely be a private contractual issue. These issues need to be meted out in the courts. And there is a theory. It's not a slam dunk, but there is a theory for my vindication or, or folks like me who have been silenced by Patreon. I think, um, what's his face? Uh, the comedian. Who, who's the uh, comedian? All, they call him alt-right comedian. Was it Owen, Owen Benjamin sued Patreon? Owen Benjamin. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. He's going at it with Patreon now too. I think I think not a totally dissimilar set of facts. Right. Yeah, I don't know if I I don't want to get too far off topic, but I mean what's the what's the legal theory behind where something just gets so big and they go, Oh, it's metaphysically it's a public utility now. Like what but like I I've never understood why how how and why that, that works. Well, it's a distinction of degree that they start treating like a distinction of kind and it's called state action theory under the 14th amendment. If so, if, if a business is a con like a common enterprise, a common carrier, then yeah, it's that they're treat. This is what the law has to do in such instances. If they want to proscribe, if they, if they figured in favor, basically conservatives, it would be helping. If they said, we're going to treat Patreon basically like a public utility, we're going to treat them like a common carrier, then we're, all of a sudden they're going to be delimited by the 14th Amendment, not ways I even like the federal government delimiting the state governments. We're going to basically treat them like an arm of the state government, and it's called state action. Um, not good generally from, from pure constitutional perspective, but it would avail conservatives in this case and it's just it's drawing a distinction of kind in the sand where there's a distinction of degree needed by the way i mean all of this stuff i, I know we've said it a couple times but I, I do want to talk in closing about the stakes of the game which i kind of promised at the beginning mm. all of this stuff matters just because of what will said because our culture is so fucked <laughs> it's so fucked that like we're having to recur to legal trickery to defend us from being able to you know from like being thrown into prison for saying you know the emperor is nude that's that's what we're talking about you know you're in your last refuge as a mm -hmm. christian man if you're just like look you know 
I'm not saying I even hate his nudity or anything, you know, ain't nothing wrong with it, but the emperor is definitely nude. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie here. And you're like, okay, there's some trick in the 14th amendment where you're all technically allowed to say that and they can't kill you for saying, it. you know, the culture has failed. The Christian cultura is gone or at least beaten back so far when you're, talking about obscure constitutional legal theories to be able to utter those words into that space in front of your face. You are just, you're, you're a stranger in a strange land at that point. Can we all agree on that? The culture has failed because it's a symptom where if we're talking this way, then the culture is done. It's failed. It's cooked. Yeah. You shouldn't be able to get in as much trouble as you can today for saying that the husband is the head of the wife. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I think that's why, just if I'm surmising a bit, I don't think I'm out on a limb. I think that's why it's hard for faithful yet slightly normier Catholics or somewhat normier Catholics to defend me full-throatedly. I don't think it's the LGBTQ issue. I think it's saying the husband's the head of the wife. I think that's literally, to them, like saying something really out there, you know, that... Uh, it's the equivalent of saying something yeah, that's, earlier. That's exactly it, Tim. That's that's why I mentioned that specific point because you've got these circles. So trans, because of the amount of media attention it gets, you know that they want you to be thinking about that. That's actually a fringe issue, trans, because the average guy on the street just thinks it's comical. And I think that's going to be wound back and it will be just a containment mechanism because people will think, oh, phew, that trans nonsense is all gone now. Things are back to normal, which is <laughs> G and L without the T. Yep. And <laughs> people are like, whew, I'm glad the crazy's <laughs> over. We can get back to gay marriage. Um, <laughs> but then really the truth is you nice. have to wind it back one step more. We, trans goes and then the L and the G goes. And then you've got the real root of it, which is feminism. And you're the guy who says the husband's ahead of the wife. And this is what the root disorder of the West is because the core attack is on patriarchy and you're a patriarch and you need to go. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Yeah, I think that's what it is. <laughs> it's, it's funny the way you put it. Like, yeah, let's let's get back to normal. Um Anyway, look at that lovely married couple with kids and you're looking at a couple of uh, bros. You know, it's like, OK, well, we're not all the way back to normal yet. It's like in Back to the Future 2 when Marty travels back to 1985 and it's all messed up and he finds out it's the tainted 1985 because Biff from 2015 you went back to 1955 and changed the 1985. It's like that. That's what it would be like to go back to quote unquote normal. And all we, all we are is L and G and B without a T, uh, you know, but you'd have a bunch of conservatives going, whew, this is a great normal. This, this 1985, even though it's not what I was expecting, it's not home. It's good enough. I don't want to have to do all this leg work and go get the sports almanac from 1955. That's too much work. That's what it boils down to with these people. It's too much work. I'm just going to, I'm going to get rid, I'm going to get used to this as the new normal, but at least we should, I guess, according to your gratefulness principle, well, uh, we should be grateful that the, these mealier mouth conservatives are willing to say, okay, at least the T is not normal. I yeah. don't know. I think yeah. that is true, but you can't all sit down in a circle and just breathe a sigh of relief that, at least now you can all agree that sodomy is a healthy lifestyle because that's still major problems in your society. And even if you did wind it back to that point, you just let things run, you're on that slippery slope again. So I don't think there's any kind of uh, save button once you've allowed that level of degeneracy to be mainstream and accepted, that much of a threat to the common good it's always going to tend towards further disorder. So even when trans is repealed slightly and wound back, which I think is coming, the machine will start up again. Hmm. It's interesting. Well, did you, um, well, starting maybe with Elliot, did you guys have a, a parting shot? I, I think it's a, it's a 1 million percent relevant issue, not just to me. Uh, some people in the comments 
will say stuff like, well, it's relevant to you because what you have to deal with, it's like, no, no, this is this is relevant to everyone. We've talked about it about 10 different times, 10 different ways on this C-Mask podcast. And we only have, what, 14 or 15 episodes. We've mm-hmm. already talked about it 10 times. Yeah, now we made a show about it because it became more personally relevant. But it's funny when people will accuse you of self-service when it's like, I, I should at the very least not be charged of self-service because literally, I, I you know, when you do something like what you did at Eaton Well or what any of us have put on the line, any of the four of us, repeatedly, you know, even just doing putting your name and your face on the CMAS podcast. It's like, accuse me of lots of stuff, bro. Don't don't accuse me of self-service. That's just stupid. That's one thing none of us can be accused of. What do you say, Elliot? Yeah, you know, I'm kind of just thinking, of course, in terms of solution, and the Lord always offers us a solution, although it never comes the way we would like it to be. And I don't see this as an issue that will be resolved by law. I don't see the culture changing. Uh, I don't see us walking back to the days before feminism. I see this working out as it has historically worked out, which is with the collapse of a depraved culture. And so, you know, we look at like fire and brimstone and, you know, the, the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and, uh, and the flood and all these various chastisements that are ultimately purifications that if we, I don't know if this comes off as doomsday-ish, but also I, it's hopeful that perhaps conversations like we're having right now in this cloud-like world where all this is just digital smoke uh inscribe something on the hearts of man so that when we are chastised and all this comes crumbling down and we get back to bare bones and live in the way the lord has expected us to or you know uh in an archaic way because i i could only imagine that the chastisement will set us back a few hundred years that uh that will we the words we speak today will be the embers that will raise the flame of a righteous world once again we just get to go through this at this particular time i like that a lot how about you will you got any parting shots brother just what elliot was saying about fire there reminds me (laughs) of that line in the psalms about the word of the lord is fire tested and this is because when everything starts burning around you, that's the thing that will keep you standing and get you through, even though it's going to hurt because that fire destroys, but it also purifies. And especially for guys like us and the kind of message that we give people about fortitude and willing to endure things, you got to take that seriously because it's one thing saying it, but it's another when it actually comes to doing it. And Jesus is going to be a tough taskmaster and be like, you think you're tough? You want to do this? So the apostle, the disciple is about being one sent and it's a a military metaphor and you're being called to go into combat like that. And don't be surprised if it gets difficult. Like that a lot too. You, Mike? Yeah, just to echo the same same sentiment. Yeah, I think you know, ch- chastisement is is coming. You know, so we we best uh, get ourselves ready for it uh, as best as possible. Um, I had a Catholic friend of ours once said to me, "He's like, well, you know, it could be worse. You could have lived in a time when you never really knew what your your values really were, and uh, you know what." A, what a like impoverished life that would have been. So I think that there is a blessing to this that, you know, we, as approaches, we can actually figure out what it is that we're, what our convictions actually, actually are because there's something actually at stake now. I think that that can be a, a good thing. Yeah. I like that a lot. And I, I just like to close on the gratefulness point that there is, by comparison from the great to the small it feels ridiculous to be talking about you know even even white martyrdom where i'm I'm still comfortable my family's still comfortable and and people really will support you i i I guess this is the closing principle for guys 
and I, I want to be grateful the way Will was intoning it. Like there are good people out there and they're looking for leaders and the leaders, the guy that looks around, looks at the fire to the left and the conflagration and the forest to the east and just says, you know, why not me? I'll, I'll, I'll do it because people respond, um, especially in their private lives. Because they're not being called to account to do it publicly. But if you're like, hey, I got a locals account, which I opened up, you know, Tuesday of last week. I got a subscribe star account, which I opened up Tuesday of last week. Can you guys support me there? Uh, pay, my, I had to ask my Patreon patrons, hey, would you switch over? Most of them have gone over there. I've picked up a lot of new people. Like people respond to what we're doing. And if you fly the banner, then people will stand under its colors. And that's happened. That's happened every time that I've been canceled or mini canceled. And it's actually more than two in the last two and a half years. But I can't talk about all the instances even, uh, but it's been more like three or four times. And I would just say that the first thing I am is grateful. Uh, I, I hope I hope that really shined through in this show because as much as temperaments are natural, there's natural variation, even in the Catholic biosphere, there's natural variation of temperaments, right? And some people, like Will saying, you, you can't ask a six foot zero guy to be a six foot eight guy. Some temperaments just really, really, really find it distasteful to be publicly unsavory. You know the way the way I guess it is. If you support me, or you support Will, you support Mike, you support Elliot, it could be really, really distasteful. But a lot of those same people will support you privately. So not everyone's being called to account at all times and all ways. And I guess I'm just grateful for the multifariousness of the means by which people can support you. They can pray for you. They can support you out loud with a big bully pulpit. They can support you financially. And I think, I think what Will said, uh, gratefulness is the key to getting through these things because it's like, even if you don't have many people supporting you, if you still have a roof over your head and a, and a wife and kids that love you, that's enough. I mean, that's enough to start. And, and, and a God who smiles on what your mission is, you, you know, you, my good and faithful servant, you are serving me well. That's really all you need. I mean, that, 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 that latter one is actually all you need. Everything else in probably descending order is the cherry on top. And you got your wife, you got your kids, you're pleasing your God. And, uh, you know, any, any material niceties that we are just the messengers, we're sent ones of Christ Jesus. And it's easy to forget that and to think that, oh, my style is, is sets me apart. You know, the way I say it sets me apart. It's, it's, it's not about being set apart. It's really about remembering that we are the sent ones from Jesus. And it's like, it's his message. It's his truth. We're just the ones intoning it, making it real for people, helping to instantiate it. And um, there are a lot of disciples out there. It doesn't feel like it in this crazy clown world, uh, cross-dressing clown world, but there are a lot of good guys out there. They're just, they got their heads down in this trench warfare. Uh, so God bless everyone. Thanks to the three of you for uh, being my bros and uh, always being such insightful bros. I just want to say that. And uh, thanks to the uh, parish orphans and the retrogrades out there that, that have had my back three or four different times in the last two and a half years alone. God bless you all. God bless. Peace. God bless, guys. God bless. See you guys around. See you next time. See you next time.